Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the seventh of the sixth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it. And it is also the 20th of August, 2022 on the Gregorian calendar. We're, we have the great pleasure of continuing in the book of Gad the Seer, and we'll be reading from chapter three. This is no longer open foretellings given to Gad about future events, but things that are actually happening, which are also parables or interesting things that happen in history that help explain other stuff. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and continue. It says chapter one or chapter three, verse one. At that time, at the feast of Passover or Pesach, on the 15th of the first month, which would be the first day of unleavened bread, there came to Dawid a Moabite shepherd who talked to him, saying, My master the king, and if you remember, this was a common greeting at that time, it was particularly common to say my my lord the sovereign or my master the king to the monarchs of the assyrians who were in power before then and even after that time when you had the assyrians come to power again after this in the 700s bc where they were taking the northern kingdom out of their own country they had records of their people still saying my master the king in the very same fashion so it was a common Semitic greeting to the monarchs, if you will. But he said, my master, the king, you have known that your servant was good to Yisrael from his youth. And now take me from dwelling among uncircumcised people and circumcise the flesh of my foreskin to roll away my reproach. And I will sit among your people. And Dawid said, Yahuwah does not want your people. And he commanded, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah forever. And we cannot seek your shalom nor your prosperity. But what can I do for you today? And if you're not familiar, the Ammonites are the sons of Ammon and the sons of Moab come from the daughters of Lot who slept with their father incestuously and had these children while he was intoxicated. It was because of that and because of what these children chose to do to their own family in their way they treated the children while they were in the wilderness and after they came back into the land. But it's because of their actions that they're barred from ever joining the covenant people, okay? All of it was to foretell things that would happen in the future, those of the father and those of a monitor among the people, but they're the ones that turn and fight, that do evil. And those are the ones that were separated never to join that new covenant that he was going to bring. But uh, again, when you look at the allusions between Yishmael and the original covenant believers, Moab and Ammon, preceded him they were contemporary with abraham which was the time of the first covenant and all of these things were alluding to what would happen in history and how that they were going to be treated by our almighty above but it says the servant answered is it not that ruth was of our people and you are one of her children and descendants and yahuwah has chosen you you and your descendants forever. Then said he, You have said defeating words. Stand here with me to ask from the mouth of my master. And you remember his master was not Yahuwah the Father, because he said, Yahuwah said to my master, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But right here, the servant points out that Ruth was his grandmother and that he's chosen to be king, so what's going on? And he doesn't know the answer, so he's going to inquire of Yahuwah about it. And look where he goes. This is what we all have to do to find the truth. And Dawid asked Yahuwah about the words of the Moabite servant. And Dawid said, O Yahuwah, 
Yahuwah Zavaoth, or Yahuwah of hosts, teach me wondrous things out of your Torah, so that I will know the rule for the servant, and what shall be done with him. And Yahuwah said to Nathan the foreteller, Go to Dawid, my servant, and tell him the word that I tell you. And Nathan went to Dawid to his room, saying, Thus said Yahuwah Zavaoth, I have heard your prayer, so tell the Moabite, It is a Moabite male you are, not a Moabite female. For I have not said Moabite female and Ammonite female, for their women and daughters belong to Yahuwah, which is why the, they could take daughters of the captive people as wives for themselves, because they were not under the curse of the male. Just like Adam was cursed, his male descendants were all under sin because of him, but the woman was deceived. So the woman was not held accountable when the man was. In the same way, the men were cursed and forbid, but the women were not held accountable. Okay. How that applies to believers today, we are the bride of Mashiach if we're in his collective body. The two become one flesh. It's the secret that was great that Shaul was speaking of. But we, in ignorance, being deceived, even as a man, uh, come to him in that capacity and that's why it's applicable for a believer so if you don't believe these things are true you have no hope that's the problem if you don't believe that he's able to deliver you and save you from the sins you've committed you will have no expectation of eternal well-being if you believe that he's all-powerful and that he died for the sins of mankind including yours then you can be a partaker of the gift that he's given you it is really that simple It says, when the Moabite heard the words of Yahuwah, he cried with a great cry, saying, I am prevented from entering the assembly of Yahuwah. And the king took him and appointed him shepherd among the shepherds of Dawid. And he was there until the day when Shalomo reigned over Yisrael for three years, and he died. So right here, just to show you, he Dawid couldn't speak for his benefit or give him a baraka. He couldn't do good for him. Or do, but he was able to, because that man of his own disposition was good. What he was able to do for him, he did. He let him be the shepherd among shepherds of Dawid. And then as you can see here, his daughter was rewarded. If you can call it that. But she was rewarded as the head concubine of Shalomo. And it says, and he had a daughter whose name was Sapphira. She was of beautiful form and fair to look upon. Sovereign or King Shalomo took her to be his concubine, and she found grace and favor in his sight more than all the concubines, and she became the chief of the concubines' residence. And this was the rule in Yisrael forever, meaning that any man that's barred, their daughters are still acceptable within the covenant. Okay? So chapter four, this is in those days, a man from Bethlehem, the house of bread, the city of Dawid went to Yerushalayim and his name was Zabad, the Parhi of the family of the Pezites or Pezerites or Perezites, sorry, to, and that's uh, Ferez or Peretz, which is the breaker, if you remember Zerach, which means seed, right? He had his hand out first. They put the scarlet thread on and then it went back. And then his brother was born. And she said, what is this? This breach be upon you. And he was called the breacher or the breaker. Peretz um, was his name. The kingdom was given to him because he was the firstborn technically, but the scarlet thread inheritance was the redemption one that would come later. And that was fully seen in history with the fall of the exalted cedar, the tender branch being taken from the top of the, the highest cedar, and then brought to the mountain heights of Yisrael to be planted. 
And that was what Yahu did when he broke down the kingdom in the land of and he uplifted the kingdom in Ireland when he took Tay Taffy there, had her marry the Hermon, and their children were continuing the line of Dawid, just as you saw where it was not the male, or the male was cursed. Zadik Yahu, his family completely wiped out except for his daughter, but it was continued through the female line that way. But <clears throat> sorry about that. Right here, you get to see a little bit of a parable and allusion to things that would happen. Zara, Zerach, and Dan spread out and they went outside of the land quite prevalently. Perez was of the monarchs for the children within the land or in Mitzrayim and then in the land. And Zara's seed was being cast or being spread, which is sown. Also, Zara, what his name means. And they were the founders of the city states of Greece, the kingdom of Attica, Athens later the Lacedaemonians, the uh, monarch of Spain, which was of the line of Zara, and then the landholders and eventual kings of Ireland transferred over to Southern Ireland and also into Caledonia, Scotland, and then there to Great Britain, where you had, it culminated with James the first of England, the sixth of Scotland, of the line of the Stuarts, which is a MacDonald family of the line of Zara, but intermarried from the kings of Ireland, where they would have had the line of Dawid through them. It was James the first or the sixth of Scotland, who was the one reigning from the house of the Stuarts that MacIsaac said, woe to the Caledonians when the, the sudden, when the seed of my daughter takes the reign, just for an idea of all that. And that is what you see with the making of the KJV, the error, intentional hiding of things that was in that version, the fact that the high church party was Catholic light, and they were trying to oppress real believers, which caused them to flee to America. All of that was foretold in Revelation. All of that was exposed in his word and played out in history. But you can see, back to the point, an allusion to Zara and Dan and the altercations and, and the things that they'll have here with what happens. Silver being redemption and part of the redeemed and things of that nature to keep in mind. Dan is judgment. Um, so there's a lot of those things that go on and it happens pretty much everywhere in scripture. That's why I'm pointing it out. If you look at anything in the original covenant and you read the stories there, quite often it's an illusion or parable of things that would happen. The great example is in the three patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the believers before the covenant, the believers in the land, and then the believers outside of the land where he's laboring for his family and possessions. And then you have in the acts of Dawid himself, everything he did, all the battles he fought, these are things in a ruachni or spiritual capacity the truth is doing against evil and error. So, ob willing, the more we go over these things, you'll see those patterns. That's why it mentions in the renewed covenant that he opens his mouth in parables. He speaks to them in parables. There's never a time that he didn't talk to them in parables. So the truth is always true. But it says, Back up to the beginning there. In those days, a man from Bethlehem, the city of Dawid, went to Yarushalayim, and his name was Zabad the, the Parhi of the family of Perizzites to pay the vow which he had vowed unto Yahuwah. For his father was sick unto death, or even unto death. And Zabad said, When Yahuwah raises my father from his sickness, I will weigh and give two talents of silver to the house of Yahuwah, to, to the hand of King Dawid. And it came to pass, as he was at the house of the shepherds on the way, he lost the money in his pocket and was displeased. He came to the city of Yarushalayim, into the inner city, and he wrote on all the city gates these words, Whoever finds the pocket with two talents of silver and brings it to me, I will give him one talent of silver as a present. And a day-night man came in, or came, 
and in his hand was the pocket with the bound talents that he had found on the way, and he gave it to the owner of the pocket. And the day night said to the Pezerite, or Perezite, sorry, Give me one talent of silver, as you said. And the Perezite said, No, for there were three talents in my pocket, and you have stolen one talent, and I was mistaken about their number. And both of them came and stood before the king. Now, I'm pointing out the obvious here, but the, the Perezite or the son of Yahuda here is lying. He had two talents. He lost them. The day night found it. And now instead of giving him the one like he said he would, he's trying to keep it to defraud this man so that he can keep his vow. And that's something that our creator wasn't going to allow to happen, as you can see, uh, well, the events that play out. And they both stood or came and stood before the king. And the king said to the Perezite, Swear unto me by Yahuwah that in your pocket were three talents of silver. And he swore to him by Yahuwah. So now he just swore a false oath. And we'll see what happens because of that. Also keep in mind in the Proverbs it says, An oath is on the lips of the sovereign. In right ruling his mouth trespasses not. That word in Hebrew for an oath is kesem. It's very similar to the word kismet, which is a word for fate. And that's what that actually means. Your fate is on the lips of the sovereign and in right ruling his mouth trespasses not. You find elsewhere in the Proverbs that it says, as channels of water, so is the heart of a sovereign in the in the hand of Yahuwah, he turns it wherever he desires. And this is why you see the sovereign rightly ruling in this instance, how this plays out, because it's all based on what is true. Those who swear by Yahuwah falsely, they're reproved according to their own ways and deeds, and you're judged by them. So if you pay attention, all these things play out in this little interaction. And the king continued, saying to the day night, Swear unto me by Yahuwah that you found the pocket with two talents of silver. And he swore to him by Yahuwah. And Dawid said to the Perezite, Give back the pocket with the talents to the day night, for this is his money that Yahuwah has hidden by chance for him. Now therefore go and write on the city gates, Whoever finds the pocket with three talents should bring it to me, for this is not your pocket. Now it says very clearly in the, in the Torah that whenever there's a matter of dispute, whenever there's a contention between men, you bring it before Yahuwah, they'll swear, and the one whom Yahuwah determines guilty pays double. What you had here is an instance of this Perezite, the son of or sorry, yeah, the son of, uh, the Zabad, the son of Zerah, sorry. No, I'm right, he was a Perezite, I apologize. Anyways, you have an instance of him defrauding his friend, or defrauding another and trying to steal from him what was his. It was caught in his hand, and the punishment for a thief is to repay double. The punishment when you go before Yahuwah and he determines who's the guilty party is that you repay double. And as you see here, he was supposed to give one talent, and now he ended up giving two, paying double for what he tried to do. And the very same thing, and both of those are no longer able to be offered to our creator. He's going to go out and have to weigh two more talents and come back to do it again. But all of that is the righteous judgment of Yahuwah in reality, in truth, by how things actually worked out. This thing happens to people all the time, 24-7, but we don't pay attention enough to realize what's going on. It says, now, therefore, I already read that part, but go and write on the city gates, whoever finds the pocket with three talents should bring it to me, for this is not your pocket. And Dawid took the pocket with the talents of silver from the hand of the Perezite and gave it to the hand of or to the day night. 
And the Danite bowed his head and prostrated himself to the earth and said, Long live my master, King Dawid, forever. And all Yisrael heard of the judgment, and they wondered over Dawid and were joyful, for they saw that the Hokma of Elohim was in him. All right, we'll do one more real quick and then pause for comments or questions, okay? Let's see how we're doing. So this is chapter five. <clears throat> it says, And the Philistines assembled themselves together to fight with Yisrael, people in multitudes that could not be numbered. The Philistines were a mixed Greek people who came back into the land that caused a great bill of strife. They were part of the sea peoples of antiquity who were like pirates who do pillaging raids on coastlines. It says, and Dawid was greatly distressed, for he was afraid of the Philistines. And Yahuwah said to Gad, go and tell Dawid, my servant, do not be worried about these uncircumcised Philistines, for tomorrow I will give them and those who oppress you into your hand. And Dawid said to Gad, I am not worthy of all the mercies that Yahuwah has done to me. But Baruch and Beautific, Beautific, sorry, be the Shem of Yahuwah forever and ever. At that night, a fire rider came from Shemaim, and a sword was drawn in his hand. And he smote the camp of the uncircumcised, a very great slaughter, so not one of them was left. And it came to pass on the morrow they came to Dawid, saying, Behold, the Philistines have been killed by those who rose up against them. None of them is left. And Dawid raised his voice and said, Now I know there is no hindrance to Yahuwah, who can deliver us from many or few, for his deliverance is like the blink of an eye, or the twinkling of an eye, which is also mentioned by Shaul in the epistle where we're going to all be delivered or caught up with him. And he said, Baruch are you, Yahuwah, who has been taking revenge for us on our enemies. And he set up a pillar and called it Pillar of Revenge unto this day. All right, so continuing with chapter 6. It says, And Yahuwah said to Gad, Go to Dawid, my servant, and tell him. Thus said Yahuwah, Let not the mighty man esteem in his might, but let him that esteem esteem in this, or let him that glory or boast, is how they put it in different versions, different translations. I believe it's in Micah or Mikael. Or he is told, or he who esteems, let him esteem in this that my help is with him. Then you should go and fear not, for Yahuwah is with you. And Gad came and told Dawid the words of Yahuwah. And Dawid said to Gad, I have known the help of Yahuwah from my youth. For who smote the lion and the bear? Which is Psalm 151, right? Who smote the Philistine? Who smote my enemies? Was it not the help of El? And when Yahuwah heard that, it was well pleasing in his sight. And, Yah and he said, Because Dawid has known my help in his esteem, for that my help will dwell in the house of Dawid forever. And Gad said the words of Yahuwah to Dawid. And Dawid prostrated himself before Yahuwah and said, Baruch be Yahuwah, for I have found favor in his eyes. And when we're lowly and acknowledge the truth, he helps us. As you can see, yeah. Dawid doesn't take credit for the things he did. He said it was the help of Yahuwah that delivered him from the mouth of the lion and the bear and the Philistines and his enemies. And because of that, his help be with his family for 
ever. And that is something that is, again, this is legally binding to our creator. Everyone who is of the literal seed of Dawid today can trust in that and can have the same kind of help that you can see his daughter receives later on in this book. But uh, to continue real quick. <clears throat> oh yeah, that was the end of that one. So we'll do chapter seven because that was short. And these are in chronological order generally, but they're not, they're not exactly one event right after the other. This is interspersed because you had kings and chronicles. You had Gad the seer, Shemuel, Ido the foreteller, and Nathan, all of them not only foretelling during these times, but also writing. And all of those things were, were actually recorded at one point, but we don't have some of those books. So you don't have everything in perfect order here, but it's generally the theme of events happen as they, as they transpired from the beginning on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it says, and again, the anger of Yahuwah was kindled against Yisrael, and he moved Satan against Dawid, saying, Go and number Yisrael and Yahuda to bring them the evil he spoke through Shemuel the seer. And that is alluded to when the people asked for a sovereign over themselves. Shemuel showed them that it was evil what they had done by bringing the, the thunder and rainstorms during the harvest. And then he had mentioned to them that if you serve Yahuwah, then both you and your sovereign shall serve him. But if you don't, then both you and your sovereign shall be consumed. And that evil is what was being spoken of right here. Because the people turned away, Satan was given jurisdiction to entice Dawid, and he was overcome to have the people numbered which brought the curse of the under the covenant onto them and pestilence. They got sick. But uh, it all ties together with that. And it goes back to the, like the head of a household. Another witness for this is in the shepherd of Hermas, where you had Hermas suffering afflictions because of what his wife and children were doing. And he was informed that because he is the man of the house or the head of the household, he has to suffer these things and then it will fall onto them. In the very same manner that as with the king, so with the people, as with the Kohen, so with the people, the leader will suffer for what the people are doing to bring them all under judgment. That's exactly what you see going on right here. And that is exactly what you see going on in every country of the world today. We have the leaders that we deserve. We have to repent as a nation to have that change. It says, and the king said to Yahuab, Yoab, the captain, and to the princes of the people, go now to and fro through all the tribes of Yisrael, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number the people, and bring me word that I may know the sum of them. And Yahuab said unto the king, May Yahuwah add unto the people, however or how many soever they may be a hundredfold and may the eyes of yahuwah our elohim watch over them but my master the king are they not all my master's servants why does my master require this and want this and why should it be a cause of guilt unto yisrael for yahuwah has said which cannot be numbered for multitude so you see while he's inclined to do something that's not right, he's not left without a way out. He's reminded by someone, if you will, like Bill Am and the dumb donkey, that what he's doing is not right, and he has a chance to correct that. This is true for everybody in what they choose to do. You might get the inclination in your mind. You might have a word from someone else, which is exactly what Shaul is talking about when he says, now, if someone says something to you about food that you're about to eat because of an idol you don't eat it because of their conscience because the world belongs to yahuwah and the fullness thereof meaning he can put the inspiration into anybody to help you not make a wrong choice and that's why you shouldn't do it because of their conscience in the same way here dawid could have heeded yahuwah and not numbered the people because it's directly against what he expressly said 
However, notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Yahuab and against the captains or princes of the host. And Yahuab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Yisrael. And they passed over the Yarden and camped at Aurora, south of the town in the middle of the watercourse of Gad and unto Yazir. And they came to Gilad, or Galead, and then to the lands of the Hittites, to Kadesh, and they came to Dan and Enan, and round about to Zidon. And Zidon is over by Asher on the coastland. It's part of the Phoenicians' territory with Tyre, if you recall. And Phoenicians were paganized Hebrews of the sons of Mehol and Heman, and the remnants that went out with them before Moshe's exodus. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hevites and the Canaanim. And they went out to the south of Yahuda to Beersheba, which is the well of the oath. And so they went out to and fro through all the land. And they came to Yerushalayim at the end of nine months and twenty days. But Yahuab did not number Lui and Benjamin. So those joined unto me and the son of my right hand. right, Or the, the, the sons of ages, if you will. For the king's word was abominable to Yahuab. And Yahuab gave up the sum of the numbering of the people unto Dawid. And all they of Yisrael were 800,000 valiant men and 300,000 men that drew the sword. And in Yahuda were 470,000 valiant men and 30,000 men that drew a sword. And the whole number of the men of Yisrael, except those of Louis and Benjamin, they were not numbered with them, were a thousand thousands and a hundred thousand men of valiance, and that drew a sword. So a million one hundred thousand men is what they're saying, I think. And the men of Yahuda were five hundred thousand men of valiance, and that drew the sword. And Yahuwah, Elohim, was displeased with this act of Yisrael, and he sent Gad the seer to Dawid, saying, Thus said Yahuwah, I am king, or I am the king of Yisrael, and I am their portion, I am their dread, I am their fortress and might. This whole Ahiah, Ahiah, the king of Yisrael, and Ahiah, their portion, Ahiah, their dread, Ahiah, their fortress and might. If you know that the Ahiah is what he called himself earlier in this book, and when he was speaking to Moshe at the burning bush, right? Ahiah, Asher, Ahiah, I am that which I am, or I will reveal Yah, which is exactly like a straight line without deviation to I will reveal Yah, which is exactly what he did in every facet of his being. But he says, and you know that not with a sword or with spear shall I deliver, and not with a man of valiance that draws a sword. For this is the portion of the heathens that stand on their might and many warriors. Yet you are not like that, for I am a man of war alone, and there is no one with me. And why would you do this evil to number your people? For that I shall smite Yisrael, in order that you may know that I am Yahuwah in the midst of the earth. So that I am the one who exists, or I am he who causes it to be, right? And Dawid's heart smote him after that. If you remember when Shaul was reproved for the things that he did, he argued, he complained, he, he said, well, I did do. He did not humbly admit his wrong. He did not confess, nor did he forsake his sin. Hence, he was not forgiven. 
Dawid's disposition, who had a heart after Yahuwah, right? He is of the disposition to repent. And you can see it right here again. And Dawid said unto Yahuwah, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, Yahuwah, put away, I beseech you, the inequity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. So he confesses and forsakes, right? And Dawid rose up in the morning, and the word of Yahuwah had already been given to Gad the foreteller, Dawid's seer, saying, Go and speak unto Dawid. Thus said Yahuwah, I lay and put upon you three things. Choose you one of them, that I may do it unto you. So Gad came to Dawid and told him, and said unto him, Shall four years of famine come unto the land of Yisrael, and three years in the land of Yahuda? Or will you flee three months before your foes, while they pursue you with the sword of your enemies, or and, or while, rather, the sword of your enemies overtakes you? Or shall there be three days of the sword of Yahuwah, that is pestilence in your land, and the messenger of Yahuwah despoil all the land of Yisrael. Now advise you, and consider what answer I shall return to him that sent me. Now the sword of Yahuwah is the word of Yahuwah, Debar Yahuwah, and the word for pestilence in Hebrew is Debar, with different vowels, Debir, they say. But it's the same word, Dalit, Bet, Resh, with different vowels for the word, matter, or thing, which is equated to the sword of Yahuwah, because the word of Yahuwah is sharper than any two-edged sword, right? And it is what is called pestilence throughout the original covenant writings. Every time he sent pestilence upon the people, it was his word. What he said would happen is what did happen. All right, so it says, And Dawid said unto Gad, I am in great straits. Let me fall, and let us all fall, or let us fall now, rather, into the hand of Yahuwah, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So Yahuwah sent a pestilence upon Yisrael from the morning, or dawn, even to the time appointed, which was three days, right? And there died from Dan, even to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people. And Elohim sent a messenger unto Yerushalayim to destroy it. And as he was destroying it, Yahuwah beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the messenger that was destroying the people, It is enough, now stay your hand. And the messenger of Yahuwah was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Yebusite. Now, if you're familiar with it, or if you're not, this account is also in two other places. It's in Chronicles, and I believe it's in Shemuel. The, if you compare them, they're a little different. Each one has got a little bit different information. When you, you can try to discern what's true by comparing all three and taking the one with the multiple witnesses for each matter. But really, they're generally the same. It's mostly in the details of how many days which plague was supposed to be, how long. But the other events are generally right on. In this particular version, however, you get the insight of it being the people displeasing our Creator that caused Him to allow. <clears throat> to allow Satan to entice Dawid, because otherwise Satan was not permitted to do anything. He has to have permission. He's like a rabid dog on a chain. This is, and Dawid lifted up his eyes and saw the messenger of Yahuwah standing between the Shemaim and the earth, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Yarushalayim. And Dawid and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. 
And Dawid said unto Elohim, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and acted very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Yahuwah my Elohim, let your hand be against me and against my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right ruling? Now right here, while it was Dawid who, enticed, who was enticed to number them, it was because of the sin of the people, and Yahuwah is a righteous judge. However, just as Yahuda, being the kinsman redeemer type, chose to take on what was not his responsibility for the benefit of his brethren, Dawid was doing that very same. He said, look, I'm the one that said to number them, let this be on me and, and punish me in my father's house, not them anymore. And because he's doing that kinsman redeemer act, he was chosen. This is the whole reason. It's the, reflecting the image of the truth in history. It's something that we're all supposed to be doing. This is, and Yahuwah said, they incited Satan against you to number them, saying, thus, we will be like all the nations, but I am an L of right ruling. May I return their high heart into their bosoms or into their own bosoms, which is the pride of man that causes us to fall, right? For a broken or a contrite heart, I shall not despise forever. And the messenger of Yahuwah told Gad to tell Dawid that Dawid should go up and rear an altar unto Yahuwah on the threshing floor of Ornan the Yebusite. And Dawid went up according to the words of Gad, which he spake in the name of Yahuwah. And Ornan was looking, and he saw the king and his four sons coming with him. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And Ornan looked and saw Dawid, and he went out of the threshing floor and bowed down to Dawid with his face to the ground. Then Dawid said to Ornan, Give me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build thereon an altar unto Yahuwah. For the full price shall you give it to me, that the plague may be stayed from the people. So you see, he repented, he confessed and acknowledges, but now he has to make restitution for full repentance. And it costs him something. It's not free. This is something we all have to keep in mind. And this is exactly why it mentions in Sirach, in the Apostolic Constitutions, and like Hokma Shalomo, to appropriate your sins or to make propitiation for your sins by giving to the poor. If you can't make restitution directly, it says in the Torah, to the one that you've wronged, you give it to the Kohen. And the Kohen is supposed to use it for themselves and distribute to the poor. When we don't have that assembly or the, build, the ability right now to be an assembly to do that, your ability to help those in need helps to, ex, to forgive you of the things that you've committed. <clears throat> Then, sorry, verse 30, it says, And Ornan said unto Dawid, Take it to you, and let my master the king do that which is good in his eyes. Behold, I give the oxen for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meal offering, I give it all. And King Dawid said to Ornan, Nay, but I will truly buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is yours for Yahuwah, nor offer a burnt offering without payment. So Dawid gave Ornan for the price or for the place 600 shekels of gold and for the cattle 50 shekels of silver, current money with the merchants. And Dawid built there an altar unto Yahuwah and offered burnt offerings and shalom offerings and called upon Yahuwah. And he answered him from Shemaim by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. Meaning he called fire down from the Shemaim to consume the offering as his sign of approving it. Something he did 
with Shalomo, something he did with Eliyahu, something he did with Manoach, and he also did that with Gideon, if you recall. And if you don't, you can see when you read those accounts, he's the one who not only is the one ascending into the Shemaim that men perceive going up, both in the apostolic times and before. That's why it says there's only one who's gone up and come down. Messengers are allowed to, but he's the only one that does it of his own volition. And people watch him ascend, right? But uh, the other thing that he does to call attention to that when he approves of their offerings is he, is he consumes it with fire from above. Okay, and it says, and Yahuwah commanded the messenger and he put his sword back into the sheath thereof. And the plague was stayed from Yisrael. At that time, when Dawid saw that Yahuwah had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan the Yebusite, and he did not despise him, then he sacrificed there unto Yahuwah for the rest of his life. For Dawid could no longer go and sacrifice unto Yahuwah in the high place at Gibeon, where there was an altar unto Yahuwah and a tabernacle which Moshe made. The, the bronze altar that was from the wilderness tabernacle was in Gibeon, is what he's talking about. And that's where he would originally go to that high place to offer. But after this event, he would sacrifice here for the rest of his life. For he was terrified and weakened because of the sword of the messenger of Yahuwah that he had seen. And uh, that's definitely a wonderful thing to keep in mind. It's horrible, but wonderful, especially when you think about the census and the things that go on. The way it's supposed to be done in our country is according to Torah. And in the Torah, you're not supposed to number the, the women, the children, or the Kohen. And in our country, we have the free choice of using a religious exemption not to number your whole family, but to just to put them in. Because we're not doing that, we're, we're having the same problem. And that's why every 10 years with the coming of the census, you'll see uh, they have prevalence of diseases and sickness on top of what is already happening on a yearly basis because of compounded sin for the people but i this is vital to keep in mind it's wonderful stuff if we would hold to the truth it's always for our benefit so thank you for your time and you have a wonderful day we'll see if we have any comments or questions but if not shalom